Welcome. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about cardiomyopathy, or we're going to go over a fairly brief overview of the three different types of cardiomyopathies, as well as uh, some of the ways they come about and some of the consequences of development. Um, so on the left here, we have a uh, normal heart. So what we're looking at is obviously thin-walled right ventricle, uh, relatively thick-walled left ventricle, with lots of cardiac myocytes that are going to allow for uh, for contraction. We know that the left ventricle's primary function is going to be uh, its ability to contract in order to overcome the afterload and eject blood into the system. A couple of things that we're going to talk about uh, with this video, uh, one of them is going to be our end diastolic volume, the other is going to be our end systolic volume. Um, so the end diastolic volume is going to be the amount of uh, fluid left uh, or the fluid that's in the ventricle after filling. So fluid in ventricle after filling. And we're also going to talk about the end systolic volume, which means the amount of fluid left in the ventricle after ejection. So fluid remaining after ejection. And if you hear people talking about an ejection fraction, really what they're talking about is um, they're looking at the end diastolic volume versus the end systolic volume. Uh, so in order to have a high ejection fraction, what that means is that we're at the end of systole uh, or after contraction, we've ejected most of the blood that entered during, uh, during filling. So our, our end systolic volume is much less than our end diastolic volume. Whereas when we're looking at someone with an impaired ejection fraction, what's happening is they have this filling with impaired uh, contraction, which leads to much more blood remaining in the ventricle after contraction. So that being said, and having kind of those things uh, in mind, we're going to start talking about cardiomyopathy. And the first one I want to talk about is a dilated, uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy. So first we're going to talk about dilated car cardiomyopathy. And if we take a look at this ventricle compared to the normal one that we have below, we said it's incredibly thin-walled. So what's happening in a uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is that the ventricular wall is thinning or we're losing cardiac muscle or the uh, myocardium is becoming uh, impaired and we're actually losing muscle mass. And we actually see uh, it becoming more round. So uh, the left ventricle is generally has more of a spear-like or uh, elongated uh, appearance. Whereas in a dilated, dilated cardiomyopathy, we actually see the left ventricle becoming more round. Uh, so we see more rounding of the left ventricle. And in these cases, it actually can be so round that it starts to uh, impair that uh, intraventricular septum or starts uh, pushing into the uh, right ventricle. So in a dilated cardiomyopathy, we have more rounding of the left ventricle and the ventricle becomes thin walled. And the reason that this is happening is because we start to have destruction of our cardiac myocytes. So if we take a look at our normal heart, we have a bunch of uh, tightly packed cardiac myocytes that are, or myocardial cells that are going to allow for um, for this uh, thick wall ventricle. Now what happens in someone who has a dilated cardiomyopathy is generally uh, one of two things that's gonna lead to a reduction in uh, myocardial tissue. One is they have a decrease in oxygen supply or nutrients. So what that means is that uh, they don't have the uh, amount of oxygen or amount of nutrients they need to supply our myocardial cells or allow them to perform their function. Um, the most common cause of this is acute coronary syndromes, where someone has a blockage in a coronary artery, and as a result, they can't meet their MVO2 regularly. The second that we see is an increase in workload. Or we often see a dilated cardiomyopathy occurring in patients who um, have maybe hypertension and ACS. So those two things together increase the workload of the left ventricle, but decrease oxygen supply. And as a result, we can't uh, adequately supply the myocardial cells and they begin to become ischemic and die. Uh, cocaine use is another good example of something like this, where the person has vasoconstriction of the coronary arteries, they have an increased heart rate and blood pressure. So their heart is working harder with a decrease in supply. And if we take a look at what happens to our cardiac myocytes is we start to reduce the ability to supply oxygen to these cells. So as the cells are no longer getting oxygen, they begin to kind of shrivel up and lose their 
function. So we start to see death of these cells. So you can see the cells become smaller. Uh, we'll draw in the blood supply here. So we have either, maybe we have some basal constriction happening. So these, the vessels are really tiny, or maybe it's the fact that we have a blockage or some ACS going on that's preventing us from uh, supplying adequate oxygen to, to these cells. But one way or the other, we have um, basically death of these uh, myocardial cells. We have shrinking and death of the cells. Uh, so we see death of myocardial cells, which is gonna lead to that shriveling. Now, if you think about the consequences of this is we generally need our uh, left ventricle and the, the myocardial cells to fire in syncytium. So when we have these densely packed or these tightly packed cells, they can all squeeze together and squeeze in unison, which is going to allow uh, a strong contraction. Now, what happens with dilated cardiomyopathy when we have destruction of these cells is this: some of these cells are no longer working. So while this cell here maybe tries to perform its function and squeeze, it doesn't have the support of any of these surrounding cells. And as a result, we obviously have a, a dramatic reduction in contractility. So we think about what this means for my ventricle, it means a couple of things. Um, one, if we look at all the space that we have here, so we obviously have way more space in this left ventricle. So one of the things that means is that in a dilated cardiomyopathy, we have an increase in and diastolic volume, or we have more space for filling, so we can have much more filling. But as we talked about, we have impaired contraction, which is going to lead to an increase in end systolic volume, or because we can't contract as hard, uh, the patient now has this, uh, all this blood remaining within the left ventricle. And this is one of the common causes of heart failure, congestive heart failure, is we have this dilated cardiomyopathy, which leads to uh, this uh, essentially impaired ejection fraction. So that's dilated cardiomyopathy. We have thinning of the ventricle wall, the left ventricle becomes more round, its contractility is impaired, and the consequences that we have uh, related to that are this increase in end diastolic volume, uh, but also this increase in end systolic volume where we start leaving a lot of blood behind. So the other, uh, one of the other ones I wanna talk about is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So um, the second picture here, we're looking at um, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy alone is generally the result of a congenital disorder. So um, typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the result of a genetic disorder that results in thickening of the ventricular wall. Now, we can also talk about heart disease in which someone has um, hypertrophy due to things like hypertension um, and uh, increased workload or arrhythmias. So we can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is specifically the genetic disorder. But when we talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we're also going to talk about hypertrophic heart disease or hypertrophy that occurs as a result of high blood pressure, um, that occurs as a result of increased workload, um, or things that are going to make the heart get bigger. So that being said, as we take a look at the ventricle here, we can see that it is incredibly thick walled. So we see that we have an increased thickness uh, of the left ventricle. And that's because the cells have grown. So hypertrophy means increased cell size. So if we take a look at what the myocardial cells look like in this case, is instead of being kind of these uh, thin, tightly packed myocardial cells, we have this growth. Um, or they've gotten much larger. So we have thickening of our uh, myocardial cells or increased size or growth. And like I said, that could be the result of a genetic disorder, or we may actually see that occur as a result of increased workload. So whether that's, uh, we have an increase in afterload, Maybe we have an increased heart rate. Something that's making the heart have to work harder. Now, where this differs from the dilated cardiomyopathy is that we don't have the decreased nutrients or oxygen supply. So we have an increase in workload, but we're able to maintain that workload or meet that workload. So as a result, the cells actually get bigger or grow larger. Now, if we think about the consequences of this is people might say, well, now we've got this thick left ventricle. The left ventricle functions based on contractility. That's great. We're going to have 
you know, this increased contractility will be able to eject more blood. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, so uh, we do generally see an increase in contractility or the ability to contract with uh, hypertrophy of the left ventricle or as these mild cardio cells get bigger. But if we look at our filling space, it is dramatically reduced compared to uh, our normal heart. If we look at our filling space in our normal heart. So filling space is reduced. So if you think about what that means is I have a decrease in my end diastolic volume or the amount of blood that's going to be in my left ventricle following uh, diastole. Now, what happens is we generally don't see a huge change in the end systolic volume, or may even see a reduction in end systolic volume. So it may remain unchanged, or we might see a, a small reduction in end systolic volume. So whereas in a dilated, cardio, uh, dilated uh, uh, left ventricular cardiomyopathy, what we end up seeing is usually an impaired ejection fraction. Sometimes in these patients, the ejection fraction is actually maintained or we don't see a, a falling ejection fraction. Now, what we should remember with this is because of this incre decrease in end diastolic volume, we also see a decrease in cardiac output because we're not filling as much as we normally would. So whereas we should normally eject about this much blood from the left ventricle, we're ejecting much less. So because we have less blood, uh, leaving towards the system, we actually see a decrease in cardiac output. So we're made, we may, whereas we may be able to contract and get the blood out of the left ventricle, we actually have an impaired cardiac output because it's just less blood leaving. So that's our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, finally, I want to talk about a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, and in a restrictive cardiomyopathy, what's occurring is we have stiffening or fibrosis of the left ventricle. So it may not necessarily be that we have an increase or decrease in size. Left ventricle, left ventricle may have uh, a consistent size, but we start to see uh, uh, fibrosis. And this fibrosis leads to stiffening. And if you think about the problem with that is that uh, if my left ventricle becomes stiff or has a much harder time contracting, then I'm going to lose my ability to have stroke volume or stro my stroke volume uh, falls. Some of the causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy um, are protein disorders, so things like uh, sarcoidosis, where we have uh, some protein disorders, um, so protein storage disorders. We can see it develop in people with ACS. Um, you can see it occurring with uh, cancer, where people might have uh, fibroids starting to form in their left ventricle. Um, and a result of all these cases, we start to see fibrosis. So if we look at our normal uh, heart, we actually don't see a huge difference in terms of the appearance of our myocardial cells. But the problem is that these myocardial cells are much more fibrotic. So we'll use kind of this red uh, marker here to show that we have all this fibrous tissue, which is restricting uh, movement. So we have this restrictive uh, fibrotic tissue that's forming within the myocardial cells that is preventing um, the left ventricle from contracting well. So restrictive fibrous, fibrous tissue is forming within our myocardial cells. Now, if we think about the consequences of this, our end, end diastolic volume shouldn't change too much. So we should have our EDV uh, remains the same because we haven't necessarily lost as much size. So the filling is not necessarily unchanged, but our end systolic volume will be impaired. Um, or we're going to see an increase in our end systolic volume. So increase in our end systolic volume because our contractility is impaired, our stroke volume is impaired, and we can't eject as much blood from the heart. So similarly to our dilated cardiomyopathy, our restrictive cardiomyopathy patients will also have uh, an impaired um, ejection fraction. Um, it's important to understand the differences between these uh, myopathies or the difference between the ventricular remodeling that's occurring here, because when we start talking about different pathologies or different cardiac pathologies, a lot of them revolve around what's happening to left ventricle, the remodeling it's occurring, and the consequences this has on the rest of the body.